Revelation, is it a hard book to understand? The one book of the Bible with a divine what? In chapter 1, verse... Oh, you thought school was out for the summer. Chapter 1, verse what? 19. Jesus says to the Apostle John, Write the things which you have seen. That's chapter 1. And speaks of Jesus Christ. John turns around there on the island of Patmos and there is Jesus. His eyes like a flame of fire. His countenance like the sun. Oh, there is Jesus. Resurrected and glorified. Chapter 1 speaks of Jesus. Then Jesus said to John, write the things which are. That's chapters 2 and 3. And speaks of the churches. Seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. To Philadelphia and Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, Laodicea. All the churches. And there's a lot to say for you and me. And then Jesus says, write the things which will take place after this. Or meditauta in the Greek. After this. That's chapters 4 through 22. Come on, class. 4 through, come on. 4 through 22. A plus plus. 4 through 22. Chapter 4, verse 1 starts with the words, after these things. I always think of the commercial Saturday morning. It's about 1985. Those are us that were born in the 80s, after these messages, we'll be right back. You guys all remember that? Oh yeah, and the little claymation guy by the fire hydrant, after these messages, we'll be right back. <gasps> after these things, chapter 4 starts with and ends with. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says, after these things I looked, and then at the end of the verse says, after this, the Greek phrase, metatauta, flashing light, saying the third section starts. The things which will take place after this. And chapter 4 speaks of the rapture. Chapter 5 speaks of the church in heaven. Chapters 6 through 19 speak of the great, what? Come on, guys. The great tribulation. Seven years of Hell on earth. God pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world for seven years. The church in heaven, but on the earth, a tribulation. But chapter 19, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes back to the earth. Satan is bound for a thousand years. Jesus rules and reigns in Jerusalem for a thousand years. The lion lies down with the lamb, the scripture says. Men beat their, plow sh or beat their spears into plowshares. They take their M16s and turn them into shovels. They study war no more. There is peace and prosperity for a thousand years. But at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loose from the pit. And he leads all the rebellious of the world to battle against Jesus in the Valley of Armageddon. You know the end of that story. They, they don't win the battle. Satan is thrown into hell. The world is judged in chapters 21 and 22. There is a new heaven and a new earth. Not a hard book to understand. Chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, meditauta, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. John was marooned on the island of Patmos. Don't think of palm branches and white sandy beaches. Patmos was a rock in the Aegean Sea, a mile or two long. John was marooned in excruciating pain. Remember the story? He was boiled alive in oil, tortured, but he didn't die miraculously. He's in excruciating pain. He's dying. He's plagued by problems. And there he looks up to heaven. Christian, whatever you are going through, look up to heaven. Psalm 5 says, in the morning... You shall hear my voice, O Lord. In the morning, I will direct it to you and I will look up. Psalmist says, I'm going to wake up in the morning and you are going to hear my voice, God. I am going to look up. Not down at all the pain and all the problems. Up at heaven, at the hope of heaven. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, set your mind on things above not on things of the earth. In other words, don't be thinking about all the things of earth, all your problems, all your issues, all your trials and tribulations and situations and this and that. No, set your mind on things above, on heaven. 
Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus. That's where you should be looking at Jesus in your mind's eye at Jesus at heaven. A couple years ago, when I learned how to ride a motorcycle, Andy over here taught me, couldn't go to the class, Andy taught me. One of the first things Andy taught me was about turning. Those of you that ride motorcycles, you know that's kind of the hard part. It's kind of like riding a bike, except you kill yourself if you mess up. And one of the first things they teach you is turning and the natural inclination or tendency when you turn is to look down. You want to look down at the wheel. You want to make sure you don't hit a parked car or hit an oncoming car. And that's the natural thing. You want to look down. But what Andy taught me, rightly so, was to look into the turn. When you're turning, you want to look where you want to go. And if you look to the right, you want to go right, your bike will just go there. If you look to the left, you will go there. You look down, you're going to die. You're going to crash. You look up, you're probably still going to die, but at least you'll go through the turn. Man, that's how it works. When we look down at all the problems, and oh, what about this? And what about that? And what about this, this issue and this trial and this tribulation? If that's what you're thinking about, that's what you're looking at, you are going to crash and burn. But if we look up to where we are going, heaven, to Jesus, oh man, we are going to go to heaven. John says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And verse one, the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place metatauta or after this. John hears a voice, come up here. It's like a trumpet. Come up here. What a day that will be when with our ears, we hear the voice of God saying, come up here. When we hear the trumpet, first Thessalonians, if you don't have this one down, you got to get this one down. Chapter four, verse 16 says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, the Christians that are alive on the earth and remain shall be caught up, raptus in the Latin, where we get the word rapture, caught up, raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. One day, the door of heaven is going to open. We talk Sunday morning about Jesus knocking on the door of your heart, saying, I want to be a part of your life. He wasn't speaking to non-Christians. He was speaking to the church in Laodicea, a lukewarm church saying, man, you are lukewarm, but I want to, I want to be a part of your life. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Open up your heart. I want to set you on fire. And right after that, open up your heart. A door opens in heaven. If you open up the door of your heart to Jesus on earth, a door will open in heaven. What a day that will be. The door opens in heaven. We hear the voice of God come up here. We are caught up. We are raptured to meet the Lord in the air. And we will always be with the Lord. To the Jewish mind, this would have made a lot of sense. Studying a little bit this week, I I came across something that interested me and intrigued me. When a Jewish man would fall in love with a woman and propose to a woman, honey bunches, will you marry me? When he got down on his knees, proposed, if the woman said yes, which was a big if, but if she said yes, the first thing a Jewish man would do would be leave. And he would go back to his father's house. And there he would build an addition. He would build a room for his bride. He would prepare a place for the bride. And the bride would be waiting and watching. She didn't know the date of her marriage. Picture that, girls. You get engaged, you have no idea when you're getting married. You just know one day the guy is going to show up, knock on the front door, and bam, you got to throw on your wedding dress and go. And the woman would be waiting, watching. She didn't know when the bridegroom was coming back. The bridegroom didn't know when he was coming back. When the father said, okay, the place is prepared, go. The son would jet out of there, man. He would get out of there like lightning. He would run to the bride and he would start shouting, walking through the city. My love, my love. And when the woman would hear that, she would be there watching TV or combing her hair or ironing her wedding dress or whatever. When she heard the bridegroom, (laughs) when she heard the bridegroom calling her name, she would drop everything. 
She would run out the front door and she would meet him halfway in the streets of the city. And they would be married right then and there in the street, in the middle of the city. It's a Jewish thing. I don't get it either. But right there in the middle of the city and the bridegroom, the son would take the bride back to the place he prepared for a seven day honeymoon. By Jewish law, for seven days, the man and the woman would not go in or out of the one room. Seven days, one room, the honeymoon. What a picture. Do you you see the picture? Jesus is the son of God, the heavenly father. And Jesus is coming back. For who? You and me. Scripture says we are the bride of Christ. Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms, John 14, verse 2. I go to prepare a place for you. And Jesus left. He was out of here, ascended into heaven, left to prepare a place. And Jesus right now is building your room, a place for you and me. And we are like the bridegroom. We are waiting. When are you coming back, Lord? We are watching one eye on the cloud. Are our ears going to hear the voice today? Are we going to see you in the clouds? Is today the day we are waiting and watching? We don't know when he's coming back. Might be today, might be tomorrow, might be tonight, might be next year. We don't know. We are waiting. And when the Lord comes back, we are going to meet him halfway, if you would. Not in the street, but in the clouds. And he is going to take us to heaven, to the place he prepared. Not for seven days, but for seven years. We're going to talk about that more in the weeks to come. On earth, there's a great tribulation for seven years. But in heaven, the church is with Jesus. A honeymoon, if you would, for seven years in heaven. What a picture. What an analogy. And the scripture says, come up here. I will show you things which must take place after this. Keep waiting, my friends. Keep watching. You don't know the day. You don't know the hour. Have one eye on the clouds. Both feet on the ground. But they might not be there for very long waiting for the Lord. And immediately, verse 2, John said, I was in the Spirit. John walked through the door of heaven, and immediately he was in the Spirit. On the earth, we can be in the Spirit, or we can be in the flesh. The Bible talks about the Spirit and the flesh. The Spirit is the part of your heart that wants godly things. But the flesh is the part of your heart that is tempted and tainted and wants ungodly things. There is a battle, Galatians says. They are fighting for your soul, the flesh, against the spirit. That's why Galatians says, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's why Romans says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. In other words, don't feed the flesh. Starve it to death. Make no provision for the flesh or the lusts thereof. Walk in the spirit. But I don't know about you, but I get tired of my flesh. I get tired of being a sinner. Anybody like me in the room? No? (laughs) Three people, okay. I get tired of being a sinner, man. I get tired of saying stupid things with my mouth. I get tired of thinking stupid thoughts. I get tired of my feelings and my emotions and my desires all skewed and out of whack. I get tired of being a sinner and being in the flesh. But one day, we are going to walk through the doors of heaven and we will be in the spirit immediately. We aren't going to be tempted anymore or tainted. We aren't going to have desires for ungodly things because the scripture says, when we see him, Jesus, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. What a day. Caught up into heaven, raptured into heaven forever with the Lord and immediately in the spirit. Immediately I was in the spirit, John says. And verse two, behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. The throne was set. It wasn't shifting sand. It was set. The word there in the heat in the Greek, excuse me, is anchored is what it means. The throne was anchored anchored was set speaking of anchors and waters remember what jesus said to the woman at the well jesus said in john chapter 4 i'm going to read to you whoever drinks of this water the waters of the earth will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that i shall give him will never thirst 
For the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. If you drink of the waters of this world, if you're thirsty for satisfaction and you're drinking of what this world has to offer, you are going to be dissatisfied. You are going to thirst again. If you enthrone false gods, the gods of this world, man, the throne is shifting sand. You aren't going to be satisfied. You know the drill. You've been dreaming of that new car. You've been saving your pennies for years and years. And the day comes when you buy that car. Oh, man, all your dreams have come true. And you drive that car for a week or two or a month or three. And you get one scratch. And then you get five scratches. And then you get ten scratches. You get a stain on the carpet. You get a flat tire. A year or two goes by. And then the new model comes out with the new body style. Man, you don't want the old car anymore. That one car that was your dream. No, you don't want that anymore. You aren't satisfied. You want the new car. You know the drill. You get that girlfriend. Oh, man, you have been praying for that one for, well, all your life, to say the least. You get her and, oh, last, you have somebody to hang out with. And you start hanging out. A month goes by. Two, three months goes by. You start to argue. You start to fight. Blah, blah, blah. You break up. And you aren't satisfied because the things of this world will not satisfy you. You fill in the blank. It could be your car. It can be your boyfriend. You fill in the blank. Things of this world will not satisfy, but God satisfies. Delight your soul in what is good, Isaiah says. You drink of living waters, you'll never thirst again. You enthrone God on your heart. You worship God. Say, Lord, I want satisfaction in God. The throne is set. And you will be satisfied. A throne set in heaven. And verse 2 says, one sat on the throne. God. And he, verse 3, who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. God was on the throne He was like, the scripture says, a jasper and like a sardis stone. A jasper was like a diamond. It was translucent, translucent, excuse me, crystal clear, reflected the light. And a sardis stone was like a ruby. It was blood red. That's interesting because John, the author of Revelation, wrote the book of 1 John. And John said in 1 John 1 verse 5, God is light. And John said in 1 John 4 verse 8, God is love. God is love like a jasper stone, or excuse me, light. God reflects the light. The scripture says God dwells in inapproachable light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Revelation chapter 21 says that there is no need of a sun in heaven because the lamb is the light of heaven. Man, that is what I look forward to. I think the most about heaven. There's never going to be a rainy day. Never going to be an overcast day. Man, San Diego weather. Sunny 365, man. For the rest of eternity, there's going to be sun. Hallelujah. I look forward to heaven. Because God is light like a jasper. And God is love like a ruby, blood red. Scripture says God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us. And Jesus shed his blood, his red blood on the cross of Calvary. God is like a jasper light. God is like a sardis stone red, shed his blood. That interests me and that interests me because, and stay with me, in the Old Testament, there were 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. The tribes were represented, the stone, stone, excuse me, stones were worn on the breastplate of the high priest, symbolizing that the tribes represented by stones were on the breastplate and on the heart of the high priest interceding for Israel. And the Jasper stone represented Reuben, the firstborn, the first of the 12 tribes. Reuben means behold a son in the Hebrew. 
And the Sardis zone represented Benjamin, the youngest, the last of the 12 tribes. Benjamin's name means son of my right hand in the Hebrew. Jasper, for the first, behold a son. Sardis, for the last, son of my right hand. Symbolically, we are on the breastplate. And on the heart of the great high priest, Jesus Christ, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. God is on the throne and you are on the heart of God. A Sardis owner in an appearance. And verse three, there was a rainbow around the throne, an appearance like an emerald. All around the throne, there was a rainbow. Rainbows in the scripture symbolize grace. Remember the story of Noah and the ark if you don't know that one you should know that one <laughs> noah you know the story god judges the world floods the world for sin and iniquity but noah the scripture says found grace in the eyes of the lord and noah was taken out of the storm out of the flood and put into an ark with all the animals which had to be a really miserable experience if you ask me. There he is with the animals for days and days and months, but after the flood, after the rains recede and the waters are, are washed away, God says, I will never flood the earth again. God makes a promise, never, and God creates the rainbow, a symbol of grace. I promise to never flood the earth again. The story of Noah and the ark, is a picture of the rapture and the tribulation and grace. What do you mean? The church finds grace in the eyes of the Lord, for it is by what? Grace that we are saved. And we are taken out of the storm, out of the great tribulation. We are put into heaven, a place prepared where there is a rainbow around the throne, where there is grace around the throne. What does that have to do with me? Right here, right now, you might be thinking everything. Because the book of Hebrews, turn there with me, Hebrews chapter 4. A verse that will revolutionize and revitalize your walk with God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews says, come boldly with confidence, not arrogance, but confidence before the throne of grace. Because there's a rainbow around the throne. It is a throne of grace, not a throne of wrath, a throne of judgment, a throne of grace. Come boldly, Hebrews says, to obtain mercy and help in time and need. Find grace at the throne of God. Man, when you need mercy, when you need grace, when you need help, man, it's a time of need. It's a storm. It's a flood. You're drowning in anxiety and fear. You're just trying to keep your head above water. When you need help, come boldly to the throne and find grace at the throne of God. And find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Where was Noah? In heaven? No. On the earth. The book of Proverbs says in chapter 16, verse 15, In the light of the king's face is life, and his favor is like a cloud of the latter rain. In the light of the face of the King of Kings, Jesus, there is life. I have come that you might have life, life abundant. His favor, the favor of God is like the latter rain. Find grace and favor at the throne of God and in the eyes of the Lord. This is something that touched my heart the last day or two. Because I've been buying into the lies of Satan. Who says, John Mark, you can't ask for a blessing today. You didn't read your Bible long enough. Oh, you can't expect to be blessed by God. You, you said that mean thing. Sorry, maybe tomorrow. Oh, you only went to church three times this week, not four. 
I'm sorry, man. Um, just three blessings, not four. Okay, man, sorry. Try again next week. That's the way we can start to think. Oh, God, you can't bless me because I don't deserve it. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. God, you can't bless me because I haven't earned it. Uh, yeah. And you are going to in the future? Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, no. <laughs> Scripture says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and this, even the faith not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Man, when we start saying, Oh man, I went to church four times this week. Whew. Hook me up with the blessing, Jesus. Ah, yeah, I deserve it. I read my Bible for like two chapters this morning. Oh man, hook me up with the Spirit. That's works. That's boasting. Oh, I read my Bible. Oh, I went to church. That's works. Oh man, we can start to live life that way. God bless me. If I do this, bless me. Oh God, I didn't do that. Sorry. Okay, bless me next time. God wants to bless you. Not because you deserve it, not because you earned it, because God is good. Because it's a throne of grace. Because we can find mercy and grace and help in time of need. You will never deserve it. You will never earn it. I will never earn God's blessing on my life. You will never deserve love and joy and peace. You will never deserve to be married to a man or woman of God. You will never deserve to have a vision for your life. You will never earn, oh man, never. Come boldly, Hebrews says, before the throne of God and find grace. Grace is unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. God's favor like the latter rain. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. Nothing to do with you. The grace of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but when I hear come boldly to the throne of grace, when I hear God wants to bless me, even though I haven't earned it, even though I haven't deserved it, Man, I want to read my Bible, not for one chapter, but two or three or four or five or ten. I want to go to church, not once a week, but man, at every service of the week. I want to pray, not, dear Jesus, bless my hamburger, but Jesus, I want to look up to heaven and spend an hour or two or three in prayer. I want, who wouldn't want to fall in love with a God of grace? Come boldly to the throne of grace with confidence, finding grace and mercy and help in time of need, because there is a rainbow around the throne, a throne of grace. And verse four, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their head. Around the throne of grace were 24 thrones with 24 elders. Who are these guys? Chances are, can't be dogmatic, but chances are they are the 12 patriarchs from the Old Testament. Benjamin, Reuben, Gad, Joseph, the guys. And the 12 disciples from the New Testament. Because if you read Revelation chapter 21, there are 12 gates, 12 entrances to the New Jerusalem. And on each of the gates is written a name of one of the patriarchs. Benjamin or Manasseh or Gad or Naphtali. You walk through the gates, and on the foundation are written 12 names of the 12 disciples on the foundation of the new Jerusalem. 12 patriarchs representing the Old Testament, 12 disciples representing the new. Chances are the 24 elders are the 12 patriarchs and the 12 disciples around the throne of God. But whatever they are, they are elders, Revelation says. Elder, what is an elder? Not talking about your grandpa or your grandma who is elder. No, elder is presbyteros in the Greek, where we get the word Presbyterian, because Presbyterian churches are elder run for the most part. Presbyteros, the word elder means aged one, old guy, or mature one. It's not talking about just being old. Being a senior citizen, no, it's talking about being old and mature. An elder is a man marked by maturity. Do you want to be a young man or a young woman marked by maturity spiritually? I do. 
oh, I'm not old, I'm young, but I want to be mature. I want to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to grow and mature spiritually. If that's you, Revelation has some great things to say. We're going to read about the 24 elders eight times in Revelation. Each and every time there is a lesson to be learned. If you want to mature and you want to grow spiritually. Here in chapter 4, verse 4, the elders are sitting around the throne, spending time in the presence of God. If you want to grow spiritually and you want to mature Spend time in the presence of God. Whatever you do in life, if you want to get good at it, it takes time. Man, if you want to devote your life to music, you don't practice for five minutes a day, no, five hours a day. You want to devote your life to being an athlete. Now, you don't dribble the ball for 10 minutes out front. No, you dribble for hours and shoot hoops. Man, you practice for hours and hours. If you want to devote your life to being the Xbox champion of the world, what do you do? What do all the guys do? Spend hours and hours on the couch playing Xbox, Halo, 9000, whatever. Man, it takes time to get good at something. It takes time to grow and mature in the Lord. But how many of us spend five minutes, maybe ten minutes with the Lord? Day by day. Oh, you go to church on Sunday, great. Church on Friday night, great. But wake up in the morning, oh man, overslept. Okay, a verse or two, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool, love you, Jesus. All right, off to work. And that's great. A verse or two, love you, Jesus, is, is better than no verse. No, love you, Jesus. But man, if you want to grow, and if you want to mature, it's, it's going to take more than one minute. It's going to take more than a, a five-minute read on the way to work or on the way to school. It's going to take time. Spending time in the presence of God. Spending time reading the Word. Waking up in the morning, reading the Bible. Maybe a chapter, maybe ten chapters. Spending time in prayer. Not Jesus, bless the hamburger and the hot dog. But Jesus, bless me. I need mercy. I need grace. I need help. Here's my time of need, Jesus. Spending time doing what you're doing right now. Coming to church, worshiping the Lord, studying the word, communion, fellowship, praying for your brothers and sisters. It takes time. The psalmist said, I am like a green olive tree planted in the temple of the Lord. I like that. If you want to be like a green olive tree, if you want to grow and mature, you want to bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self. You want to bear fruit. Be planted in the house of the Lord. There in Jerusalem was a green olive tree planted right in the courtyard of the temple. Growing right in the presence of God. Man, if you want to grow, you want to bear fruit, you want to mature, plant yourself in the presence of God. Spend time in the presence of God. And you will be a young man, not an elder, but a young man or a young woman marked by maturity spiritually. The elders on 24 thrones sitting in white robes, crowns of gold on their head. And verse 5, from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Man, when you see lightning and you hear thunder, You know that a storm is coming. And there is a storm coming on the earth. The great tribulation starting in chapter 6. There's lightning, thunder. And verse 5, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God? What's that talking about? I thought there was one spirit of God. Are there seven? No. The book of Isaiah, we talked about this a month or two ago. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, speaking of Jesus, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Seven personas of the Spirit. You are one person, Kevin. You are one person, Brando. Not two. You are one. Now, to your mom or your dad, you are a son or a daughter. To your family, you are a brother or a sister, a niece, nephew, granddaughter, whatever. 
to your boss, you are an employee. To the people that you go to school with, you're a classmate. The people you work with, you're a coworker. The people you, man, practice with, you're a teammate. Well, which one am I? Am I a teammate or a coworker? Am I a son or am I a grandson? Which one am I? I don't know who I am. Uh, no, you're all of the above. <laughs> you can be more than one at once. You can be a granddaughter and a co-worker and a teammate and a friend. Hey, you're one person. The spirit is one, but there are seven personas. Might, understanding, power, wisdom, knowledge. All one spirit, but seven personas of the spirit. Seven spirits before the throne of God. Symbolized, Revelation says, by a lamp and by fire. Seven lamps of fire. The lamp symbolizes illumination. The spirit illuminates when you are in the dark. The spirit illuminates the mysteries of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, Your eye is not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Man, your eye hasn't seen, your ear hasn't heard, but the spirit searches the deep things of God, the mysteries of God. Maybe you say, man, I read your Bible and I hear it with my ears and I see with my eyes, but man, I don't get it. I don't understand. I, I'm in the dark. Man, I read Revelation. What? What in the world? Man, I, man, I, I read the, the Old Testament. Man, I, I do not understand. Pray, Spirit, fill me. Illuminate. Because the Spirit illuminates and searches the deep things of God. And the Spirit will open up your eyes and your ears and your mind to understand the things of God. You're reading your Bible, you don't get a verse, pray. You're reading your Bible, you don't get a chapter, pray. You're reading your Bible, you don't get the Bible, pray. Spirit, illuminate, search the deep things of God. The lamp symbolizes illumination. And the fire symbolizes consummation. Our God is a consuming fire. Holy fire, burn away my desire for anything that is not of you but is of me. I want more of you and less of me. Empty me, empty me, fill me, fill me with you. That's a prayer for the Holy Spirit. To burn away fleshly desires for things that aren't of God. To burn away, to consume the refiner's fire to burn in your heart and in your mind, in your tongue, in your life. Man, the flesh, that ungodly part of you, to burn and to replace and to refine, to replace oh, the fires of lust and passion with a zeal for Jesus Christ. The spirit, hmm, a lamp, that symbolizes illumination. Fire, that symbolizes consummation. Seven spirits before the throne of God. And before the throne, verse six, there was a sea of glass like crystal. There's a sea of glass. Other translations say something like a sea of glass. We're going to hear that type of language all through the book of Revelation. There's a man 2,000 years ago trying to describe the end times and trying to describe heaven. Now, you picture being John in 8095 trying to describe a helicopter. How would you do that? That's what we're going to read about some of the Horses, manes, and face like a man, and tail like a scorpion. Man, he says, it's like this, or like that. You be John and, and try to describe heaven. Man, you go to heaven, you come back, and you're trying to describe heaven to people on earth. It's like trying to describe the beauties of Europe to a one-year-old. Oh, man, you should see the Louvre. You should see Westminster Abbey, and Notre Dame, and Stone. You should see. Goo, goo, ka, ka. We're the baby. John is describing heaven. We don't get it. But John uses language like it's like this. It's like that. John says it's like a sea of glass. It's something like a sea. It's something like crystal. Something inexplicable and beautiful. 
a sea like glass. There's no wind, there's no waves, there's no storms like glass. When I go wakeboarding with Mike and Brooke, and the, let me rephrase that. When Mike and Brooke go wakeboarding, and I go crash a lot on the water, and when we go out and the water's, man, all up and down, and there's wind and that's no good, but when we go out and there's no wind and no waves, man, the water is, 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 is serene and silent. Oh, we say the water's like glass. Oh, yeah, the water's like glass. The sea is like glass. Remember what Jesus said to the sea? That wasn't like glass where there were wind and waves and a storm. Remember that story? The type disciples said, Jesus, why are you sleeping? We are dying. Don't you get it? We're going to sink. We're going to drown. We're going to die. Remember what Jesus said? Stands up, walks to the front of the boat. Ah, peace be still. <laughs> ah, I'm going back to sleep, guys. Good night. <sighs> sea of glass. Peace be still. When the waters of your soul are troubled, when life's up and down, remember what God said. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Don't be biting your fingernails, walking back and forth, anxious, worried, afraid. What's going to happen? No, be still and know that he is God. Be anxious for nothing, the scripture says, but everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Man, pray about everything. Don't be anxious. Don't be stressed out and worry. Jesus said, do not worry. That's a sin. Do not worry. Trust in the Lord. Be still. No, he is God. No, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Know that the Lord delivers him out of all of his troubles we read in Psalm 34. Be still and know the Lord is God. But on earth, there are going to be storms. There are going to be trials and tribulations. Be still and know that he is God. But... In heaven, there are going to be no storms. There are going to be no trials. There are going to be no tribulations. You are never going to have a bad day, ever, for the rest of eternity. Never a bad day. Never going to rain. Did I mention that? Yeah. Never. Scripture says there will be no more crying, no more pain, no more sorrow for the former things, the Scripture says passed away because there is a sea like glass heaven if you have opened up the door of your heart to Jesus that's where you're going and that's home heaven one day the door is going to open we are going to be caught up raptured forever with the Lord on a honeymoon with Jesus a place prepared Immediately, when we walk through the doors of heaven in the spirit, man, no more temptation, no more Mr. Mean, no more grouchy, in the spirit. There's going to be a throne of grace, beautiful and inexplicable. And we are going to spend time in the presence of God. That's a good thing because the scripture says, in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. More joy than you have ever experienced on this earth. More pleasure than anything on this earth in heaven. And there will be a sea of glass. Oh man, there will be peace. Peace. You'll never be afraid again. You'll never cry again. You'll never be stressed out again. You'll never have to take another final. Peace. Heaven. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, but reading Revelation makes me want to go to heaven. Now, right now, God, come on. Come on. Maranatha. In the scripture, that means come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Pray with me.